Okay. So we are group nine, and today we'll be presenting to you the paper Segdiff Image Segmentation with Diffusion Probabilistic Models. Our group is Ilkin, Dominic, Shireen, and me, Chase. So to give you an overview of what we'll be speaking about today, uh, we're first going to cover the related work, motivation. Following this, I'll discuss the specifics of the diffusion model. Then Ilkin will discuss the architecture and training, and Dominic and Shireen will discuss the experiments and ablation studies, followed by a conclusion. Uh, we should note this paper is currently unpublished. It's just on archive. This is probably because it's written by Facebook. So the image segmentation task, as we all know, is a classical computer vision task. However, thus far, uh, the state-of-the-art models use encoder, decoder networks, and a pre-trained backbone. So these models are FCNs, RCNNs, UNET, etc. And uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, the image segmentation task we're speaking about now is kind of just the most simple segmentation available, where, ex for example, in this image, we're separating uh, the surfaces of the image. We have the door separate from the floor, separate from this uh, clock. And um, I mentioned this because this is not the more complex task of semantic segmentation. We should also note that this is a task with a unique ground truth. So this can be very similar to what we do with super resolution with diffusion models. And this is the first uh, attempt to use diffusion models with segmentation. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is the first application of diffusion segmentation. And in this paper, they actually end up with a model that doesn't need any pre-trained backbone, and they have end-to-end -end training all within the diffusion model. They propose a new conditioning method for this implementation, and they talk about the concept of using multiple generations from their diffusion model to create sharper outputs. And then finally, they claim new state-of-the-art performance um, in the test suite that they uh, look at. Here's an example of the segmentation task on this image of a bus, and we get a pretty sharp output as you'd expect from the state-of-the-art. So now I'll cover the diffusion model specifics of the paper. Uh, this will be fairly brief because this, is seen, this has been seen by all of us uh, many times by now. But we start with this forward process Q, um, where we're going to be noising an image at each time step. We do this for a total of T steps uh, with these produced latent uh, noised variables, X1 to X capital T, and our input X0. And of course, uh, this follows this equation here. Where we have our noise schedule uh, beta, which is defined by this large equation seen here. And again, this is going to produce XT given any XT minus 1. So when it comes to uh, sampling a noise sample at time t, uh, we can do it with this given formula. So given x naught, uh, we can get our sample t using uh, this mean and this variance, where alpha bar t is going to be the uh, product of all the previous alpha samples, where alpha is 1 minus the beta t we saw on the last slide. And of course, we can parameterize this to a simpler equation, where xt given x naught uh, is defined here, um, where epsilon is going to be our normal distribution of noise. And what does this process look like? Well, we're actually going to start with a segmentation map and noise that up to the uh, normal distribution, whereas previously we started with an uh, input image, uh, for example, a face. So for the first process, it's going to be parameterized by theta, and it's defined by this Markov chain, um, where p theta of x0 is predicted from p theta of xt, which is the normal noise. We do this using this equation. So given xt, we can get xt minus 1 uh, with the predicted mean and this variance. So this mean will actually be predicted with a neural network, which we'll discuss in the next slide. And then this variance uh, is described by this equation here. Uh, we'll see this variance again later, but we'll see it only as lowercase sigma t, which keep in mind is the square root of this uh, variance term seen here. So for our denoising neural network, we're going to train it to predict this noise epsilon theta. And we do this using KL divergence. Um, we've seen this many times before, so it's not too complicated. Again, this will be the normal noise centered at zero. And lastly, for inference, uh, we sample using the following equation. So given xt, we can get xt minus 1 with our noise estimation and the uh, standard deviation I discussed earlier. So given some image, we have our normal noise that we denoise into segmentation map. So now we discuss the specifics of the implementation of the diffusion model. How is it actually being used in this paper? Well. They're going to view segmentation as a conditional generation task, where the input image is the conditioner. Keep in mind, this is different from the text image generation task, where the text is the conditioner. And what we've seen in the past is this conditioning is going to be applied by concatenation. So for example, with super resolution, a uh, convolved input is going to be concatenated with the estimation before uh, going into the unit. In this case, we're going to use summation. We'll see the uh, impact of this later in the presentation, but keep that in mind for now. 
And then we actually gonna, are redefining the task to be learning the DPM of a residual model. Um, now Ilkin will take over and discuss the architecture of this paper and the training they use to train their DPM. Thank you, Tate. So um, I'll be going over the SegDef architecture to understand each of the components in more detail. Uh, so we have the input signal XT here, and then we pass this XT to F, which is basically a 2D convolutional layer. And then we have our I, which is the conditioned image. And we have our um, network G over here, which is the input image encoder. So this network consists of a 2D convolutional layer. And then we have an RRDB with residual connection. The RRDB stands for the residual in residual uh, dense blocks, and we can see it here. So these blocks, they combine multi-level residual connections without using any um, batch normalization layers in between. And after that, we have a 2D convolutional layer followed by a leaky relay activation. And then we have a final 2D convolutional layer here. So we pass this I um, conditioned image into G to get the feature map out of this. And then here we sum, um, we sum this feature map we got from G uh, with the extracted features that we got from F. And we pass this into the unit over here. E stands for the encoder and D stands for the decoder. Um, and here we can see that we also pass the time embeddings um, into a linear layer in the unit. And this refines the predicted segmentation map. So we can obtain this x t minus one here and we do this for t steps. And this is the architecture. So in diffusion models, the epsilon theta, this one is typically a unit, uh, but in this paper, they modify the diffusion model by conditioning this on, um, by conditioning the step estimation function, this one epsilon theta on an input tensor. So this is how they define it. And this combines both like information derived from both XD, which is the current estimate, and then I, which is the input image. So in the architecture, we still we have a conventional decoder, and then the encoder part is broken down to three different parts. We have E, F, and G. So F encodes the segmentation map of the current step, G encodes the input image, and E is the rest of the encoder. So um, we have like those two processed inputs that we got from F and G here. So they both have the same spatial dimensionality and number of channels. So we can just sum them up and we can pass this value to E along with T value over here. The T is the current step index. Uh, so we pass this into E and also to D. And um, in each, each of this, when sending it to E and D, um, it is embedded using a shared um, learned lookup table. So this is important because we will be plugging this into another equation in the uh, following, like coming slides. Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. So the training process is, uh, I'll be going over that. So the input is um, the total diffusion steps T and then the data set. So the user gets to um, set the total number of steps here. And during each iteration here, we sample, we randomly select I and M. I is the image and is the corresponding ground truth. Um, and it's binary because it's segmentation, it's either one or zero. Um, and then we get to choose the, iterate, we choose the iteration number T from a uniform distribution and then epsilon from a standard distribution, the equations that we already saw. So for this line of code here, we sample xd according to this equation over here, and then we compute the fxd uh, plus gi. 
and then we apply networks, uh, the encoder and the decoder to obtain this value over here. And then we repeat this until it converges. And we have this loss function, which is a modified version of this um, equation that we saw. And since um, we know the I, the image, um, and since it's training, we also know the corresponding graph truth. We basically set x0 to mi here. For the inference, um, we have the total diffusion steps t and the image. We don't have the ground truth because it's inference. And then for each t over here, um, we set these ones that we went over. And then when we are setting the x t minus one, we have this equation and we are basically just plugging the previous equation here, which is the epsilon theta that is conditioned on i. And when we do that, we get this equation over here. And then we return the x zero. One thing that is important here is when we compute this x t minus one, um, we add sigma t x t t z here. And this z actually comes from standard distribution, which causes the network to give different outputs every time we run the inference. Um, and we take advantage of that by running the algorithm multiple times and then averaging the results. So we have the input and then we run the code for multiple times. Um, they run it for 30 times, but in the ablation studies, they also try different numbers um, to see the effect. But here they have the subset of the obtained results from each run and then they average the results. And here we have the ground truth. We can see that when we average it, it's more consistent. Um, and then they also see an increase in the performance. And Dominic is gonna take over from here. All right, so I will go over the first part of the experiment shown in the paper. Uh, so the authors use a few different data sets to evaluate SIGDIFON. They use Cityscapes, which is a data set that contains a bunch of images uh, with or from uh, the ground view of multiple different cities. They use Feihengen, which is a data set that contains aerial images of different German cities and towns. And they use Monuseg, which is a data set that contains uh, images of tissues and organs at the cellular level. And then they use the mean intersection of reunion metric as the main metric to evaluate SIGDIF on all of these different data sets. Uh, however, they formulate it a little bit differently than I'm used to seeing, uh, where they use true positives, false positives, and false negatives. Uh, I'm used to seeing it this way with just the area of intersection of the two objects divided by the area of union of the two objects, um, which is you know, pretty self-explanatory from the name intersection of reunion. However, the authors formulate it this way where they have the number of true positives divided by the true positives plus false positives plus false or false positives plus false negatives uh, where the true positives are anytime SIGDIF predicts uh, a segmentation mask where there is a ground truth mask the false positives are when SIGDIF predicts a ground truth or a predicts a segmentation mask when there is no ground truth and the false negatives is when there is a uh, when there is a ground truth with no prediction uh, so if we look at these two squares up here the top square we take that as the prediction and the bottom square we take that as the ground truth this blue part is going to be the true positives this top white part is going to be the false positives and this bottom white part is going to be the false negatives so now that we have the metric the main metric out of the way we can move on to the actual experiments and evaluation uh, so first we'll look at cityscapes and on cityscapes the authors only use the mean intersection of reunion metric to evaluate SIGDIF here uh, however, they use two different, slightly different versions of this. Uh, the first version that we'll look at is expansion. Uh, so normally true positives, for a prediction to be true positive, it has to be exactly on the ground truth. However, expansion increases the ground truth area by 20%. Uh, so now instead of if a prediction is on the ground truth, it's a true positive. However, it also has that a 20% margin of error where if it's within 20% of the um, ground truth, then it is considered a true positive. Uh, so with that in mind, we can now look at this table and we can see that across all the classes, SIGDIF outperforms the other four models or methods that they compare against. 
Uh, and then with this table, we're now looking at tight uh, mean intersection over union. So you no longer have that 20% area margin of error. It's just you're either on the ground truth and it's a true positive, or you're, the prediction is not on the ground truth and it's a false positive. Uh, and even then, SIGDIF is still outperforming everyone else. Um, so that's cityscapes. Now we can look at Vihengen. Uh, so they, the authors introduce a few additional metrics for Vihengen. They introduce F1 score, weighted coverage, and boundary, uh, boundary F1 score. Boundary F1 score is pretty much the same as F1 score, except that now you have a similar area of margin for true positives that was, um, it was similar to the expansion uh, MIOU. So you don't have to land exactly on the ground truth to be considered a true positive. Still, you still have a little bit of uh, area of uh, error. So let's look at the actual table here. And we can see that across all four metrics, SEGDIF is still outperforming everyone else. The last data set that we'll look at is MonoSeg. Uh, the authors say that they're going to use F1 and MIOU. So we'll look at MIOU first. And of course, SEGDIF is going to outperform everyone on this metric on MonoSeg. Uh, but then we'll look at the other metrics they present, which is DICE. Uh, so DICE score is a similarity metric that compares two different data sets. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the ground truth segmentation masks and the predicted segmentation masks. Uh, if you remember, I said that they said, the author said that they were going to compare F1 and MIOU, but this says DICE. Uh, so in the text, the authors say they're going to use F1, but then in the table, they write in DICE. So I don't know which of those is a typo because one of them definitely is. Uh, but regardless of that, whatever metric is being shown in this column, uh, SIGDIF is outperforming the other one, two, three, four, five, six uh, models and methods that they compare against. So now that we've gone through the three different um, uh, the three different data sets, we can now look at the ablation tests that they've done. Uh, so if you'll recall, the model generates a number of different segmentation masks and then averages all of those segmentation masks. Uh, to get the final segmentation mask that is given to the user. So we're going to look at the effect of generating different numbers of those segmentation masks. So first on cityscapes, we can look and see that up to about five segmentation masks across all the classes, the MIOU tends to increase, except for maybe train where it kind of decreases a little bit, but generally you're increasing up to five different segmentation masks. And then after that, the MIOU score tends to plateau or converge uh, to whatever value it's going to be. You'll see a similar story on Manuseg and Vihengen, where up to five, uh, both Manuseg and Vihengen are increasing, but then after five, they tend to plateau or converge. Um, and you don't, I mean, there's a little bit of change across all of these. Like you can see here, this is starting to decrease a little bit and there's a little bit of jitter, but generally the rate of change uh, after five generated segmentation masks the MIOU starts to plateau. You don't really see much change. The other generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the other ablation test that I will look at is how the number of steps in the reverse process affects the MIOU score. So again, we'll look at cityscapes first and we can see that up to 60 steps in the reverse process, the MIOU is increasing for all of the different classes in cityscapes. Uh, however, after 60, the MIOU tends to converge and you really don't see much change. Um, for Manuseg and Weihengen, uh, you see a kind of similar story for Monoseg. It's very similar, where at around 60, 65 ish, maybe 70, the uh, MIOU score starts to plateau. But then for Vihengen, it's a little bit different, where up at about 80 is when the MIOU starts to converge. Um, right, and we'll see that here. Uh, interestingly, the cityscapes and the Monoseg uh, data sets tend to, or SIGDIF on those data sets tend to have or converge at about the same uh, number of diffusion steps, um, whereas it takes SIGDIF longer to converge on Vihengen. 
and the authors believe that this is because the ratio of the number of or the size of the image to the number or to the size of the segmentation mask is larger or rather is the same for or very similar for uh monoseg and cityscapes um and it's going to be different for by uh they believe that the larger that ratio the less number of diffusion steps required meaning that monoseg and uh, cityscapes probably have a larger image size to segmentation size ratio than by uh and so with that uh my part is done i will pass it to shreen now to finish up with the experiments and conclude the presentation Hi, everyone. So the other thing that the number of diffusion steps is actually affecting is the inference time of the model. And we can see that from this diagram here. So basically, from here, we can see that the number of diffusion step has a linearly increasing relation with the inference time. And from Dominic's previous slide, we have seen that most of the models are converging at around 60 to 75-ish number of diffusion steps. And from here, we can see that this amount of diffusion step is causing the model to infer in about 20 or 25 around seconds. So from here, the authors are actually hypothesizing that this model, the SegDiff architecture, is able to get good generation results within a very short amount of inference time with a less number of diffusion steps than other concurrent diffusion model related works. The other thing, other parameter that has an effect on the overall result is the number of RRDB blocks, which Ilkin has talked about in the model's architecture, that's the residual block in the image generator G. So from here, we can see that this is the result on the Vengen data set. And from here, we can see that when the number of RDB blocks was changed from 1 to 10, the mean IO score did not really change that much. It just effect changed from 1 to 2 points. And the similar thing is seen in case of this image here, where it's the bus class from the Cityscape data set. And in this case also, even after changing the RDBs from 1 to about 25, the changes, the maximum change it happened was like 0.2. Uh, I'm sorry, 2. So from here, the authors are actually hypothesizing that maybe the number of RDB blocks does not have that much of an, of an impact into the model's overall performance. Now, to show the effectiveness of the SecDiff architecture, they have actually worked with six other architecture variants as part of the ablation study. And the first one is basically performing concatenation of the current encoded segmentation estimate with the current encoded image instead of summing them up. The second one is using FC Hardnet 70 version 2 instead of RDBs in the input image encoder G. The third one is getting rid of the encoder F and G altogether and concatenating I with X of T. And then the uh, other variants 4 through 6 are basically propagating the current segmentation estimate FXT throughout the unit architecture and then adding it up with G of I after the respectively first, third, and fifth downsampling block instead of summing them up before sending it throughout the network. And this slide here shows the result of the different uh, variants on the Weingen dataset. These are the original images. These are the ground truth labels. And these are the results of the original architecture. Now, this is the result of the first variant where concatenation was done instead of segmentation. And in both of these cases, we see a lot of unnecessary artifacts. And in this one here, we see that the corner is missing from the segmentation mask. The second one is the result of the second variant where FC hardnet was used instead of RDBs. And in this case here, we see that this top portion here is missing this notch, and the third segmentation mask is a little bit smaller than the original one. The third column here is the result of the third variant where the encoders were removed, and in all three of these cases, we see a lot of unnecessary artifacts. Now, the last one here is a little bit interesting because this is the result of the fourth variant where the addition was done after the first downsampling block, and the authors have reported that these results actually don't have a lot of difference from the original one, but when they performed the fifth and sixth variants where the addition was done after the fifth and third and fifth downsampling block, they saw that the performance was radically decreasing. So from here, they are actually hypothesizing that performing this summing depends on the distance of where this performing is done. And as they go more deeper into the model, the performance is radically decreasing. So they say that performing this addition is better towards the beginning of the network. But nevertheless, we see from all of these images here that the original architecture is performing way better, which shows the effectiveness of their proposed architecture. Now, even though it has quite a strong few strong points, it has some limitations as well. The first one being it requiring multiple runs to get an accurate segmentation mask. And it is actually really resource expensive. And if it was possible to do this, get the accurate mask in one run, this would have been much better. 
The second issue is it's trained on a very specific type of data set and it does not really consider some complexities inside the, those data set. For example, there could be some scenes where there might be some objects with has similar colors or similar textures or maybe objects with uh, very ambiguous boundaries and we don't know how this approach might perform on those certain kind of situations. So we don't know the robustness of, of this model. And the similar thing was seen in case of the evaluation as well. We, the evaluation also lacks the complexity. And the, one of the most important roadblock was the unavailability of the source code. And if someone do, does want to perform a rebuild on this or maybe reproduce their work, that might be a little bit hard for that person to do so. So to sum it up, the authors have proposed the SegDiff model, which, which generates accurate segmentations in a very less number of diffusion steps than other concurrent works. And which actually brings us to one feature work of performing, exploring the model's generalizability to make this more robust for complex scenes. The second thing they have found that performing the summation is much more effective than performing concatenation for conditional generation. And thirdly, the, the placement of this summation actually matters and performing it in, towards the initial layers is more, much more impactful. And lastly, they have shown that using RRDBs instead of any other networks is much more if, impactful as part of to uh, encode the image. These are some of the references that we have used for our presentation. I'd like to thank you all for listening to us.